بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن إبراهيم كان أمة ولم يكن من المشركين إن إبراهيم كان أمة قانتا لله حني ولم يكن من المشركين شاكرا لأنعمه اجتباه وهداه إلى صراط وآتيناه في الدنيا حسنة وإن
Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. On behalf of the organizers, namely the Masjid Sultan Sahuddin Abdul Aziz Shah, the Shah Alam Municipal Council, and the Umar Resources in Amrahad, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Al Fadil Shah Madidat, and all of you for taking time off to attend this lecture. Before I invite our beloved brother to deliver his lecture, Allow me to briefly summarize for you Sheikh Dida's background. Sheikh Ahmad Dida was born in Takdeshva in the district of Surat, India in 1918, which makes him now only 74 years old. At the age of nine, he joined his father in Durban, South Africa, and later attended the Ajuman Islamic Madrasa, where he studied Islam, Gujarat, and English. Sheikh Didat then entered the normal secular school where having completed the six, he left to seek employment. While working in the various professions which span from being a clerk to a salesman and a manager in a furniture factory, Sheikh Didat was often visited by Christian missionaries who often posed many questions on Islam which he could not reply. Often Sheikh Didat was challenged to public debates by these missionaries. It was from these debates that Sheikh Didat developed a deeper understanding and knowledge of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Sheikh Didat wrote his first booklet, Muhammad in, in the Old and New Testament, in the early 50s, and subsequently wrote six others. Although his lecturing career began in, 19, began in 1944, Sheikh Didat started to lecture regularly only in 1958. In 1958, he jointly established a full-time Islamic propagation center in Madrasa Akid. 
Later, he also jointly established a missionary training school, the as -Salam Mission. Sheikh Didat currently is the Life President of the Islamic Propagation Center in the Durban, South Africa. Without much ado, I would like to invite Brother Didat to deliver his lecture tonight. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحق من ربكم ولا تكن من المنترين صدق الله صدق الله مرة رزيم Mr. MC and my dear brothers and sisters I read to you a very very brief verse from the Holy Quran in which Allah says, Al Haqqu min Rabbikum wa la takun min al The truth, Haqq, only comes from Allah. So do not be of those in doubt. That is the principle of Islam. Haqq, truth, right and wrong, who tells you, who has the right to tell you? Allah. But now we have a topic on the board behind me. which read the way, the truth, and the light. Now, I don't know how this subject topic came about, but actually, actually, this is a verse from the Christian Bible. Now, nothing wrong with that. It is from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14, where Jesus Christ is supposed to have made that utterance. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the Christian holds fast to that. He said, you see, we got everything. Jesus says he is the way. He is the truth, he is the life. If you want to go to God, there is no other way. See, the organizers, the people who planned this, I don't know how it came about, but Beautiful. He said, at times, anything, I said, look, let it come, it makes us to think. I'm thinking loudly now. So Jesus Christ made such a statement, and on the basis of that statement, the Christians, they claim that there is no need for another way, another deen, religion. The Arabic word deen means a way commonly translated as religion. So, if Jesus is the way, he is the deen, then you don't need another deen, another religion. Now, I'm going to show you how we can respond to that. I said, you see, this is how I do it. The people quote. They quote out of context. They don't know in what sense Jesus Christ uttered that statement. Allah Baritala gives us a secret of dealing with all these problems against the Jews, against the Christians, against the atheists, anybody, everybody. If anything is in dispute, you ask him, as Allah says, Kul Hatu Burhana. So come on, produce your proof. Your proof. Your Burhan. In Kuntum Sadiqin, if you are speaking the truth, let us have a look at your proof. So, proof has to be produced. So if, you, if they produce the proof that this is what Jesus said, they say, it's in my Bible. Where is it? It says, John chapter 14, verse 3 or 4. I didn't have time to check it up, but chapter 14 I know. What is the context? In what sense did he say that? They don't know. You see, people are just trained to memorize certain sentences, phrases, and they make a religion out of that. Jesus said, I am the way to the truth life. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus said, this and Jesus said that. I and my Father are one. And they make religion out of that. So Allah tells us, anybody makes such a claim, you're asking for proof. And they produce the proof, the Bible. 
My Bible says this, my Bible says that. But if we have taken the trouble, just a wee bit, to check up and see that verse or that claim in its context, it doesn't mean what they're saying. But we don't do the job, so we get caught out. So he said it. So you can say, no, that's not true. This you concocted it, you created this, this is a forgery. So there's a battle between us and the Christians. I said, no, we should do our homework. As Allah wants us to do the job, we must do that way. Ask him for this proof. Now, because I have been in the field doing just that, I can now talk to the Christian and tell him, I said, look, wait, wait. Let us begin, this was John chapter 14, I said, begin with the end of 13, chapter 13. I said, Jesus tells his disciples that I am going to prepare a place for you, he's telling his disciples. In my father's house there are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. You know where I'm going, and you know how to get there. In other words, he assumes that you understand. Like my brothers, they assumed where I was going. See, I went to the big masjid, and after Salat al-Makhrib, now I'm waiting for somebody to tell me where to go. Ultimately, somebody said, right, it's not here, it's somewhere just behind the masjid. I said, right, take us. So the gentleman said, follow me. So we followed him. He took us the wrong way around. So we had to make an about turn. <laughs> then when we reach here, I don't know. Eh? This is right. They press the button, fourth floor. I said, fourth floor? That's where the meeting is? They said, yes. I said, right. We went to the fourth floor. And there is a table set for refreshments. I said, no, I didn't come. While I'm passing, I can see that there are people seated here. And what refreshment for me? Amazing. I said, no, man, I want to be at the table. Take me there. We couldn't find this place. In this building, we couldn't find the place. <laughs> you know, now look, this is how things happen. In the building, I can't find the place. We are down there, and you took me to the fourth floor. Then I said, and we're going around and around. People want to shake hands. I said, look, there's no time for shaking hands. Let's go to... You know, I have a tendency to get angry with you people. What are you doing to me? <laughs> you enjoy the job, me too. I enjoy. But what is, look, you can kill people like that. You can kill people. In innocence. I want to meet my brothers, I want to meet you all, and then they're taking me around. Table set there, it's right on the fourth floor. They said, right, refreshment. I said, no refreshment, I come for this refreshment. I want to keep them refreshment. However, so Jesus says, you know where I'm going, and you know how to get there. They say, Master, we know not whether thou goest, where you're going, we don't know, and how can we know the way? In other words, Jesus assumes that they understand, and they say, we don't understand what you're talking about. It's an amazing situation. This mighty messenger of God, the trouble he had with his people, with the Jews. He's telling them, you know where I'm going and you know how to get there. They said, look, we don't know where you are going and how, how can we know the way? So Jesus, in answer to that, he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's in answer to that problem. Because they misunderstood. Jesus is talking about spiritual matters. They are... Huh? That, that, that's... Therefore, they say, we don't know where you're going and we don't know how to get there. He's talking about Allah and His good pleasures to get there. He said, look at me, the way I'm going, if you go, you will reach there. That is what he's saying. You will reach Allah's acceptance. So he said, we don't know where you're going. So he said, look, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. They misunderstood again. It was too heavy for them. Too heavy. They still don't know what he's talking about. No, look, I'm only reading the book and I'm telling you, I said, look, he, that they don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> he's actually telling them that the way to God is personified in me, look at me. The way I'm going to go, you will reach there. The truth of God is personified in me, look at me. 
You follow me, you will have to. Real life is personified in me. Look at me. The way I am going to go, you will reach your destination. Allah. So they say, you know, they did this other words, but so this is all this we're talking about, fancy thoughts, we don't know what to talk about. Just show us the Allah and the Sakai said us. Just show us God. We want to just show us God and look, all this fancy talk we don't want to know. Just show us God that we can see him and we'll be satisfied. <laughs> so Jesus says, Philip, the disciple who asked, for the group, the spokesman for the group. He says, Philip, you have been with me for so long. Why ask us thou, show us the Father, and show us God? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The misunderstood again. They think he's the father, his own father. No, no, it's a, it's a stupendous situation of misunderstanding. Each and every word, every phrase, every sentence, the misunderstanding. So he's so provoked, Jesus Christ. He's telling the Jews, his disciples, ye of little faith, ye of little faith, means you've got no faith, be iman, without iman. Then he explains to them as it is explained to little children. And they can't seem to grasp. So he says, I even yet without understanding, yet you can't understand. I'm talking to a little baby. And when he's provoked further, he says, Oh, faithless and perverse generation. He's telling his own disciples, not the generality of Jews. Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I be with you? If he was a Japanese, Jesus, instead of a Jew, he would have committed what they call that honorable harakiri, suicide, suicide. <laughs> but as a Jew, he couldn't afford it. You know, he, he loved life. We all love life, but he loved life. Jews, they love life more than any other community. They can't afford to lose one. You see, yours, 10,000, he can smithereens obliterate you. That's to him is fun. But when Jew dies, it's a calamity. They love life. Jesus, he couldn't afford to commit harakiri. Okay. But now, this is how you can answer, Wallah, it is so easy. If we do a little bit of homework, just check up then what the guy is talking about. That's all. But now, let's come down to something simpler. We have here, just in the vicinity, one of the most fantastic, beautiful monument. The Sultan Salahuddin Shah Masjid. Beautiful. In my life, I haven't come across anything like it. Now I'm going to speak all over the world, wherever I go. That in Malaysia, we have the biggest flag in the world. <laughs> in Malaysia, in, in, in Asia, we have the tallest building in one of our, I think, Penang or somewhere I was there. At Penang. Tallest building in Asia. In Malaysia. What does it have? Yeah. But this masjid, I tell you, it's world class. It attracts people from far and wide. Muslims are going there for salat. I went there. I was there yesterday for Juma, Yom Juma. What an experience. Alhamdulillah. But it also attracts visitors. I was told by our trustees, people who are there managing the masjid, ask them about how many people come. They calculated, somebody said, this is over one million people use this masjid in a year, and the tourists, tourists and the musallis, people who do salat, over one million a year are paying respects to that monument. Beautiful. As a here is an opportunity for delivering the message of Islam and in, and in an entertaining manner. Now how can I see this type of opportunity and you didn't see? You know, it's a question. That Didat comes from South Africa and now he's telling you how to use your monuments. Huh? You should be the best qualified. No. You see, your experience is limited. Your knowledge of the world is limited. You are cut off on one side. I don't know they call it the Far East. You people also belong to the Far East. Huh? 
I'm from South Africa. And in South Africa, there live some half a million Muslims. Half of that half a million, quarter million are Malays. We call them Malays. They look like you. They behave like you. <laughs> they bacha the Quran like you. You know the way you read the Quran. We Hindus, we read our own style. I'm an Indian Muslim. We have our own style. But the Malay reads exactly like you. He have all the other systems of the tasbih and all just like you. The Malay is worth knowing that person. Your own brothers and sisters that they were taken away from you over a hundred years ago from here and three hundred years back from Indonesia. They go as Malays. Fantastic people. They had a hammering from the Christians for three hundred years. The Christians managed to change their language. They lost the language. The Christians change their surnames. You come across people, they're Malays. You meet them, you, when you come there, you'll meet them. Say, what's your name? Say, Muhammad Hendricks. What do you say? Abdullah Fisser. He says, what you? He says, uh, Yusuf Smith. So what? He says, you Malay? He said, yes. He's proud. I'm a Malay. But we, how do you become Hendricks and Smith and Fisser? You know? He said, no, no, no. These were our slave masters. They owned us. So we were forced by circumstances, it's a long story how it happened, but we had to inherit those names. Languages change, they speak in the language of their masters, the slave masters. But the 300 years of hammering made them into one of the most militant Muslim communities in the world. One of the most militant in the world, Malays, Malays of Cape Town. People would me. you should visit them and allow them to visit you. I know. You, ha you haven't recognized them. They tried very hard to come to their roots, roots. But you people, I don't know how. You couldn't recognize your own children. May Allah forgive you. Now, because living in that country, South Africa, See, there were so many forces at work trying to keep us down. And we had to match our wits against the Jews, against the white Christians, against the colors, against the other Indians, against the Africans to survive. I, we had a battling on all fronts. And when you are in such a situation, you develop certain expertise in achieving certain goals. Around the 60s, we reached a stage in Durban, my city, where we were now organized to go and deliver lectures on comparative religion in the city halls of Durban, Johannesburg, Cape Town, the major cities. And the city halls happened to be white area. But we went there so we can invite the non-Muslims. If we invited the people into the masjids, they won't come. So we say, right, city hall, that's the white man's area. Come, come, come here. Everybody, come. Subject, what the Bible says about Muhammad. Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ. Christ in Islam. Crucifixion or crucifixion. Is the Bible God's word and so on. And it filled up the city halls. Wherever we go. Where the topics are such that the Muslims come in their greatest numbers and the Christians also hearken in the greatest numbers. Because the topic, what the Bible says about Muhammad, to start with. So, we have huge posters, you see from a distance, you can see the word Bible and Muhammad. Bible attracts a Christian, Muhammad attracts a Muslim. Packed out, packed out, packed out. For that reason or for some other reason, the government clamped down. No more permits for us to use the city halls. No more permits. Either to gag us or they were double, developing their apartheid system. They reached the state now, not even the city halls to be used by the black man. And I'm a black man in South Africa. The Malays are black. No, no, I'm not trying to insult you. This is the situation. The Malay is black. No matter how white he looks, 
No, no, it's not your color. Where you originate. You originate in Asia, your fertilizer. Where did you come from? Asia, you are black. So, no black people can use those facilities. Beautiful facilities, like this one here. Beautiful. But we can't use it. What to do now? We had started the ball rolling. We want to shake up the country, intellectually. And we were doing it. We can go to the city halls and have people filled up with Muslims and Christians and say right at the end of the talk, any question, come along, line up. And Alhamdulillah, we can face it. Because we have the haq, truth on our side. Nothing to worry about. Now what to do? Clamp down. So we must find a way out. Survival of the fittest. Necessity is the mother of invention. Necessity is the mother of invention. There's a need now. So you have to find a way. Says, right? If they won't allow us to use the city halls, we will use our own masjids to attract them. So how do we attract them? We advertise. The masjid. In Durban, I brought a picture here. I know it's very small. This is a car. This is the Juma Masjid Durban. Juma Masjid, means Jame, Masjid Jame, the largest in the southern hemisphere, we are boasting. This one here. Is nothing compared to yours, Wallah, it's nothing. <laughs> Though it looks gold, yours is look, you know, what's, what you call it, terrazzo, ceramic, or whatever you call it. Beautiful, beautiful. But we have it in gold, and this is Mughal architecture. Beautiful also. Largest south of the equator. Fortunately, south of the equator, there are hardly any Muslim countries. So we can boast and get away with it. So we advertise, visit the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere for a free guided tour, phone, and we give a telephone number. And people phone, tourists, visitors. They come along, they phone and say, largest mosque. Where is it in the city itself? So they go to the corporation, the municipality, they want to know how to get to the mosque. So they explain like this, like that. Another group, how to get to the mosque, so like this, like that. And they said, man, that's very good, There's people wanting to go to the mosque. So we can use that, exploit that by creating what they call tours, tours. So they created tours, an oriental tour. So people survive. Oriental tour, it is in Durban. It is a short tour, it is cheap, and everything. So thousands of people, three bus loads a week, they take them around, oriental tour. And the first place, first port of call is the masjid. The people come because they think that they'll see something nice and funny in the masjid. Because they don't know the difference between a mosque and a temple. So they come. Before they come, they give us a ring, telephone. He said, look, there are 50 people on the bus. So said, that means now we must go and wait for them. On the pavement, we wait. The bus comes and stops. Welcome, welcome, come, 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 come. We take them inside the masjid. And where did we take our shoes? He says, please take off your shoes here. While they're taking off the shoes, we know we are causing them an inconvenience. It is an inconvenience. You know, if we were not supposed to take off the shoes, and if we were not asked to make wudu, We'll have ten times the more people to come to pray. Do you know that? Ten times more. You agree? If there was no wudu and no taking of anyway, he just stands alright, Allahu Akbar, and you know, ten times more people will join. Am I right? Hmm? So it's an inconvenience. So he said, please take off your shoes. They take off the shoes. So we ask, we want to start a conversation. So do you know why you're taking off your shoes? They said, no. Would you like to know? Nobody says he doesn't want to know. It's the nature of man. He wants to know why. Anything, everything, he wants to know why. So he says, you remember, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, God spoke to him and he said, draw not thy hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where understandest is holy ground. In respect of that commandment, we Muslims, we take off our shoes. No arguments. No arguments. 
The Jews can argue, the Christians can argue. It is from your book. What God told your prophets to do, we are carrying out those instructions. No arguments. Allah. But before we do all that, we stand, we have a wudu place, a pool, with taps right round. You are more sophisticated. You just put the hand and you get water. <laughs> lucky, lucky, yesterday I made wudu in the hotel before coming to the masjid. Because my son was telling me about this sophistication. So I said, I must try it out. So I went, suppose I had gone yesterday to make wudu. He said, this is evolution. You go inside there and you see, you see nothing. There are no taps there. <laughs> I said, damn it. These Malays, how did they make wudu? <laughs> if it is tayammum, there is no sand. There is no sand. <laughs> how did they make wudu? Wallah, how could they have been lost? My son told me about the sophistication, so I also went and <laughs> put my hands and I got it. <laughs> so, so, you see, first on the, so we, have, we, have, we are still a bit backward. A pool with taps right on and seats, we sit down, you know, comfortably and we may go through. You people are all athletes, you know, you stand and do everything. <laughs> And it, I find it hard. I got to lift up my leg to bring up to the sensor that height to get the water. <laughs> and you can imagine my difficulty. I'm 74 now. <laughs> Maybe the Malays don't get old at all. <laughs> so we stand on the seat, you know, we're on here. And so please get round, stand round, and we start. Say, allow me to welcome you all to the largest mosque in the Southern Hemisphere. This is a Muslim house of prayer and it is called a mosque. A Hindu house of prayer, a temple. A Jewish house of prayer, a synagogue. And a Christian house of prayer, a church. This is a Muslim house of prayer and it is called a mosque. And allow me to welcome you all with the traditional Islamic salutation of wishing you all Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And some Jew, they respond in the... Because generally there are Christians and Jews who come a to it. You can hear one of them, The Jews respond. But the others, they love to hear those words from us. What a welcome. They expected somebody to put a dagger through them. You know, the Muslims, they are terrorists. They are fundamentalists. They are backward barbarians. That's what they are expecting from us. And here we say, Ahlan wa Sahlan, family and play, come, come. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And their hearts open up. Wallah. This is a salutation which opens out the hearts of even your enemies. Why not use it? So it says, now, what we do is, why we do our shoes explain. Before we go in for prayer, for salat, we say we make ablution, wudu. And there are three good reasons I say that I can think of. I train my young men to do the same. In my absence, they won't do the job. Nothing, or work doesn't close down. I say there are three good reasons why we make wudu. Ablution. Number one. Purely from the hygienic point of view, we say, no one can find fault with a person who washes himself five times a day. It's a good hygienic practice. And everybody nods his head. It is a good hygienic practice. Secondly, it serves certain psychological purposes, meaning mentally it's preparing the person for prayer. We are not making wudu because we are dirty. We might have just had a shower. But now we're making wudu. What for? Are we dirty? No. This is hygienic practice, and secondly, it serves psychological purpose. Mentally, it's preparing the person for prayer. While he's going through that, imagine the benefits. But we come to that later. First is hygienic, second is psychological. Thirdly, I said this is also another commandment given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. In the book of Exodus, that is the second book of the Bible, Exodus, it is written, and Moses and Aaron and their sons washed their hands and their feet thereat when they went into the tent of the congregation, in the, in the house of prayer. They washed 
as the Lord commanded Moses. So we Muslims are still fulfilling another biblical commandment. As soon as they are in the main house of prayer, they say, please sit against the wall. More comfortable. On the carpet, on the ground. It's an experience of a lifetime. It is an experience for the Western of, of a lifetime. Sitting on the ground, on the carpet, huh? and using the wall as a backrest, a condition, a joke, a condition, nice and cooling, refreshing, and seated there, sit down. And there's a psychology. Once they're seated there, it's hard for them to get up in a hurry. <laughs> no, if you just talk, walk around, and you talk, and say, all right, right okay, I right, thank you, very nice, very big building. No, no, no. Sit them down, sit down. Take yourself feel at home. And they sit down. So as you're seated here, you are facing north. That's from South Africa. From here, you face west. I say, as you are seated here now, in our masjid, you are facing north. And every mosque in South Africa, they face north. You know why? Because Makkah is there. The attention of the Muslim world all converges. When you are in the east, they face west. From the west, they face east. From the north, they face south. And from the south, north. All the attention converges onto one spot, Mecca, to symbolize the unity of the Muslim people, that we have a common direction of prayer. Not that God is there. Because the Holy Quran tells us, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِكِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ To Allah belongs the East and the West. فَأَيْنَ مَا تُوَلُّوا فَسَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ And whichever way you turn is the presence of Allah. Whether you look up or look down or look sideways, Allah is everywhere. Facing in that direction, we say, Allahu Akbar, meaning Allah is the greatest. We signify that we divorce ourselves from all earthly things and we will solely contemplate on God. So saying, we read chapters and verses from the Holy Quran celebrating the praises of God. And we go into different postures. And in every posture we celebrate His praises. From this position here, we go into what we call Ruku. And in that position we say, Subhana Rabbi Azim, Subhana Rabbi Azim, Subhana Rabbi Azim. Glory to God the Great. Glory to God the Great. Glory to God the Great. From where we arrive, saying, Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, that Allah listens to the one that praises Him. We have the assurance that our Lord and Cherisher, our Creator, who is closer to us than our jugular vein, as the Holy Quran testifies, he says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ We are indeed closer to you than your very life there. If he is that close to us, then we do not have to shout on the top of our voices wanting a deaf God to hear. Because he listens to our secret thoughts, our feelings, and our emotions. And with that assurance we arrive. Sami Allahu Luman Hamida. And from this position we say, Allah Akbar. And we go into the sujood, prostration. We demonstrate. In that position we say, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. The highest part of man goes down to the lowest before his maker and we praise him to the highest. This is the form of our prayer. And this is also biblical. Because this is how all the prophets pray. All the prophets pray. And when we say all the prophets prayed, it sounds like a sweeping generalization. But it is not so. I tell them. Because if you have been reading your own holy scripture, your Bible, you will be able to confirm what I'm going to quote you now. And I quote from the Old Testament, from your Bible. Acceptable to both the Jews and the Christians. The Old Testament, both Jews and Christians have accepted. And I'm quoting. And Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. And again, and Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And again, and Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. And again, and Jesus fell on his face and prayed to God. I would like to know from you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm asking the Christian and the Jew. I would like to know from you, because there are many women, they all come together. I would like to know from you, how does a man fall on his face and pray? Except the way we Muslims do. Can a circus acrobat do any better than that? No, no, you like to know. Show us, man. Is there another way of falling on your face? And if somebody is praying, you say, look, that is how Jesus prayed. 
When the man goes into the sujood, he said, that is how Jesus prayed. So what? My God, praying like that, putting his head down and putting his bumps up, what is he to pray? No, that's going in his mind. But, but that's how your God did it. Your God did that. He is shocked. He is amazed. Because he has read, but he hasn't studied, just like ourselves. We read, but we don't study. We are the same. That is how Jesus prayed. I said, you remember when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, towards his last days on earth, I'm only reading from there. He went there with his disciples, Hawari Yung, and he told them, wait and watch, meaning keep God. The Jews were after his life. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. He said, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. Remove the difficulty from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. What did he do? He said, wait and watch. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. We are not ashamed, we Muslims, to follow in the footsteps of the prophets. We are not ashamed to humble ourselves. The men will meet the prophets of God humble themselves before the Lord. But the modern gentleman is more particular about the creases on his trousers than humbling before God. He wants to sit tight on his backside. In that position he wants to tell God what to do. And little wonder he doesn't listen. And they are saying now, either God is dead or he's dead. You say, no, he's neither dead nor dead. There is a means of approach. How do you approach your creator, your Lord, your cherisher, your sustainer? The spiritual positions of mankind, they showed it to us. Follow the good example. But you don't want to? Mm -hmm. Then now I'm telling you, that the Americans are spending millions today to learn what they call transcendental meditation. They work two yards long from the Hindus. And they are paying through the closes in the process. I said, if you only follow in the footsteps of your own prophets, what Moses did, what Abraham did, what Joshua did, what Jesus did, what Muhammad did, you wouldn't have to go to the Hindus to learn this two yard long word and free come down. Yes. What an opportunity, Allah. In a most innocent manner, we are delivering the message of Islam. Then it says, you see in this house of prayer, no idols, no images. No idols, no, no pictures, nothing. We are worshipping the unseen God of the universe exactly as your Bible says. The Bible says that God is spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in truth and in spirit, not in form, shape, or size. It was the most beautiful mental picture you created the supreme being. It is still a pigment of your imagination, and you are not to worship your imagination. Worship God. Our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when you stand up for prayer, you stand with a feeling, with a realization that though you don't see him, he sees you. He said, Ka'anna katarahu, as if thou see, he sees you. You don't see him? He sees you. That is all. That is the nearest we come into our grasp, understanding of Allah. We don't try to picture him. How big he is, how handsome he is. Huh? This is the quick sense of the spiritual world. You want to know about God? He's like this and he's like that. He's like a monkey, he's like an elephant, he's like a snake. He's like a woman, he's like a man, he's like an elephant. What are you doing? Allah is not like this or that or that. Laysa ka nislui shay. Not only there's nothing like him, but nothing is like the likeness of him that can be imagined. This is Allah we're worshipping. And the name of the Almighty, we call him Allah. And Muhammad is not our Allah. We use this word, we prefer this word Allah to the English word God. You know why? Because this English word God is often misused or misapplied. If you go to a Hindu temple, I'm telling them, with your children, and you see all the statues and images lined up, you have a right to say that these are the gods of the Hindus. And if a Hindu always hears it, he doesn't mind. That is so. Here is my Ganesha, my Subramani there, my Shiva Lingam there, my Hanuman there. 
So these are the gods of the Hindu. The Hindu doesn't mind. Then you speak about gods of ancient Greece, about gods and goddesses who ate and drank, who wrangled and plotted, carried away the wives of other gods. And in English, you spell God with a capital G and you spell God with a small g. Do you know that? Do you know that? Look up the dictionary. Capital G means this, the Almighty and the small g means a little God. Not as big as the other one. No, you see, capital G is small g. Then in English, you want to make a woman out of God, you add a des, goddess. She makes a woman. It's a woman God. You know, God and goddess. Gods and goddesses. They talk about ancient Greece. Gods and goddesses. Then if you want to make a small god, you say godling. And look at the dictionary. Godling is a small <laughs> Then in English, English, English. When you are looking after somebody's child as a guardian, they say you are a godfather to the child. And the woman, she is a godmother to the child. You know, you can't do that for the word Allah. You can't say this is Allah Father, Allah Mother. This is, how do you going to make a feminine? This word Allah is a unique word, Wallah. In the Arabic language, it has its rules of grammar. But you can't make a feminine, you can't make a, a diminutive, you can't make a plural. It has its rules of grammar, but there's nothing you can do with the word Allah. Allah has to be retained as Allah. So it is a unique word for a unique God. And this word, Allah is in your Bible. In your Bible. You say, which Bible? I say, which Bible do you read? Whatever! No, no, what I I'm, it is, I'm not joking. I'm telling you. Seriously. I said, there is not a Bible on earth. You have dozens of different versions. You have the Roman Catholic version. You have the Protestant version, this one. Yeah. You have the revised version, revised standard version, and the new world translation, and on and on and on. Dozens of versions. Not only versions, I say in every language of the world, the word Allah is written. You can't take it out. I promise you, you can never take it out. The word Allah from your book, you can never take it out. What language? There are 2,000 languages in which you can get the Bible today. Do you know that? 2,000. And in every language the word Allah is there. Amazing. But it's, the word is getting stuck in their throat. You know, this is Allah. It must be another God. I say, can there be another God? There is no such thing as another God. There is only one God. Yeah, your concept might differ, but there is only one God. And His name is Allah. In the Semitic languages, in the language of the Jews, in the language of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, the name of God Almighty is Allah. But the Quran tells us, you can call him by any name. Call him Rahman, call him Rahim. There are 99 attributes given, call him by any name. Ya Razzaqo, Ya Ghaniyo, Ya Rahmano, Ya Rahimo, Ya Quduso, Ya Qayyum. Call him by any name. As long as that name is not contaminated. You know what that means? That when you are using that name, it conjures up a certain mental picture. Suppose we told these non-Muslims the name of Allah, God, is Muhammad. Immediately he sees a mental picture of a, a camel, an Arab. When you say Muhammad, you know it's an Arab, a camel driver, born somewhere in Arabia. He has so many wives. No, a picture. And you know, he had to defend his faith against the mushriks of Mecca, the pagans, and wars, and wars, and wars. All this, it conjures up a picture. As soon as you use a name, it conjures up a mental picture. Out! Disqualified. If it creates a mental picture, disqualified. You say, uh, instead of saying, Allahu Akbar, you say, Muhammad Akbar, who Akbar, finish. You may say, Muhammad, yes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, he was a very good man. His father's name was Abdullah, his mother's name was Amina, and... Uh, no, immediately is out. You say his name was Rama. A mental picture, straight away. Rama was the prince of Ayodhya. You know, his father was the king there. And he married a woman called Sita. 
And this guy Ravana of Ceylon, he abducted her and kept her for 12 years. Mental picture, it's a Krishna. I said, it's a Krishna and the Pandwas. He used to steal butter when he was a little boy. And what, what he was making jokes with the gopis. Gopis means the cowgirls, you know, when the poor things, they went for swimming, putting the sarees uh, on the river bank. And uh, this is all in the religious book. He takes the sarees, you know, the rappers, and he puts them on the trees, and he goes and sits and plays his flute. And these poor girls, you know, there's a limit to how much you can remain in the water. Your body, <laughs> body loses heat. Loses heat and the water, which was very nice and comfortable, it become uncomfortable. She, they want to get out. And the guy sitting there, Krishna, you know, with a flute, he's playing music. So this is peace, and let us have our sadis. She said, you come out. So they came out with their hands on the private path. So no, you take up your hands from there, then I give you. These are all the stories they tell us. It's a Krishna, mental picture. It's a Buddha, mental picture. It's a Christ, Jesus, mental picture. A child born stable to a Jewish girl, circumcised on the eighth day. That's what the Bible says. When he was eight days old, he was circumcised. You know what circumcision? You Malay? Huh? What do you call it in your Malay language? Sunnah. We also call it Sunnah. You call it Sunnah. 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 Yeah. Sunnah. Yeah. You also call that. See, he was circumcised. He had a mental picture. At the trial, he says, you know, somebody punched him in the stomach and said, come on, professor, who hit you? Come on, what's my name? Tell me, what's my name? All the mental picture. Wherever he went, he said, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And he ran for his life. Mental picture is not befitting God. Any name, any name that conjures up a mental picture is not befitting to God. Any name, whether you call him Muhammad or Rama or Krishna or Christ, any name. Call him Allah, call him Rahman, call him Rahim. But I say, look, Allah is his proper name. In your book, the Bible, 6,823 times. 6,823 times. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew language, the word occurs. Allah. Elohim, Elohim, which they translate as Lord God, Lord God, Lord God, 6,823 God, Lord God, Lord God. In the original, is El, Elah, Elohim. Here I have a Bible with me. This is by Reverend Schofield D. D., Doctor of Divinity. Backed by H. D. D., Doctors of Divinity, not D. Das, H. D. D. <laughs> And Mr. Chairman, I want you to come along and confirm what I'm going to show you now. Come, please. The first chapter of the Bible, the first verse of the Bible. Come a little closer. Right? This is the first chapter, chapter 1, Genesis. That's the first book of the Bible. Chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's a small number there. You look down. You see the word here, El, Ella, Ella, A-L-A-H. See? Allah. In English, Allah. They wrote it as A-L-A-H. Allah. Allah. So I'm telling them, I said, look, you can spell it as you like. But my language, I want you to pronounce it the way I want you to pronounce. Say Allah. Say, say Allah. I said, not Allah. Say Allah. It's difficult. It's difficult. As I found it difficult to pronounce your language. I was trying to learn some words before coming here. How many of you were there at the Madreka Square? Please put up your hands. Very few. Very few. There I gave the sample of your language, which I learned. Very difficult. When you don't know how to pronounce. You see, it's read, written, but how do you pronounce it? I don't know whether I'm murdering your language, but I felt there's some relationship between my language and yours. So I tried to think in my language, I said, look, maybe this is also how you speak. I don't know really. Now listen. Say, Oram, Nabi Akan, Kubang Kitkan, Bagi Mereka, Dari Antara Saudara Mereka. Seperti Engkau Ini. Aku akan menaruh firmanku dalam mulutnya, dan ia akan mengatakan 
kepada mereka segala yang kuperintahkan kepadanya. Dan ia akan mendengarkan segala firmanku yang akan diucapkan Nabi itu demi namaku. Jadi pada ia akan kutuntut kepada tanggung jawaban. Sound like Malay? So I said the pronunciation is written A-L-A-X by eight DGs backed by Reverend Scope. Nine altogether. Allah. As I say, Allah. This is the Allah. Allah. Now, all the new school field versions, they would have left second hour. <laughs> so I said the pronunciation is written A-L-A-H by eight DGs backed by Reverend Scope. Nine altogether. Allah. As I say, Allah. This is Allah. Now, all the new Schofield versions, they would have left taken out. Once I talk about it, the Christians here, they activate and say, hey, look, man, these guys are using it. That the name of God is Allah in your Bible. All right, let me go. That's in the community. <laughs> but now, I'm telling you that Jesus Christ, you probably deserve that in Africa. They say that when he was on the cross, and the cross was in Matthew and Mark, Does that sound to you like Jehovah? Jehovah Lama Sarafani? They say no. Unless your ear is diseased. I said, listen, again. Allah, Allah Lama Sarafani. Does that sound to you like Abba? Abba Lama Sarafani? Abba means father in Hebrew. This is no. I said, listen. Allah, Allah Lama Sarafani in Hebrew. Allah, Allah Lama Sarafani in Arabic. Sound similar? Yes. Allah, Allah Lama Sarafani. Allah, Allah, Lama Tarakhani. Almost identical. These are two different dialects of the same language. Like Indonesian and Malay. These are dialects. Similarity is there. Then in the book of Revelation, that is the last book of the New Testament, of the Christian Bible. Chapter 19, we read there, that John the disciple, he saw a vision. And in the vision, he heard the angels in heaven singing, Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. And when the Christian goes into ecstasy, very happy, like he's Allah Akbar. He says, Alleluia! Alleluia! In my meeting, a Christian comes and questions, and he thinks that is bold to do that over, so all the Christians shout, Alleluia! Alleluia! How to stop that? Very easy, very easy. Very easy. I said, You know what you're shouting? You know what you're shouting about? You are saying, You're praising Allah. So what? I said, look, Alleluia. What is Alleluia? Hippie Bure. Hippie Bure. Is that Hippie Bure? That God Almighty makes another star 40,000 times bigger than our star. The sun is a star. 40,000 times brighter than this one. There is another star 40,000 times. Not 100%, 200,000%. 40,000 times. If that one was near as this one, it's only 93 million miles away. But if it was this close, light would have killed everything. Light, light was 40,000 times brighter. Can you understand? Can you see anything? Can you see nothing? Light will kill everything. Light would have killed. So when Allah made that, the angel said, Hurray, hippie, hurray, Alleluia, Alleluia. Is that what they're doing? No. What is Alleluia? I said, Ya, Ya is a vocative and exclamation in Arabic and Hebrew. We begin with an exclamation. We say, Ya Akhi, O my brother. Ya Ummi, O my mother. Ya Allah, O Allah. We begin with an exclamation. You, in your language, you end with an exclamation. That's a genius of your language. I'm not trying to fault with your language. 
But this is how the languages are. So, Alleluia is Ya Allahu, Ya Allahu, Ya Allahu, Ya Allahu. I said, that is what you are singing. Oh Allah, you are the only being who deserves worship and praise. Oh Allah, you are the only being who deserves. I said, congratulations. I'm glad you're still written in the world. Allah, finish. No more Allah, Alleluia. No more, finish. Look, you must learn to kill the snake without breaking the stick. In other words, you teach the guy without taking offense. See, the stick is still in your hand. It doesn't become your enemy. So look, this is what your book is. This is how the explanation is. Now, you can do the job. You have people attracted by your mercy. But I understand that you don't allow non-Muslims to come anywhere near the mercy. You have your reasons. Maybe a program so. I don't know, my country, my alims are orthodox Muslims, good Muslims, alims. They say, go ahead. They say, this is the example of our Nabi. Our Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, he, he welcomed a Christian deputation from Najran, some distance away from Medina. They heard, these are Christian Arabs, Arab Christians. They heard that there is an Arab who is now claiming to be a prophet. He's claiming to be in communion with God. Said, so let's go and cross-examine him. We want to know what does he know. So they came to Medina, and there were no hotels and motels. And our Sahaba, and our Nabi himself, lived in little, little apartments, you know, little, little huts like okay? We were there to be accommodated. The only place available was the masjid, the masjid and Nabawi. So these Christians, they slept in the mosque, they ate in the mosque, and they had a dialogue for three days and three nights in the mosque. And Sunday happened to come by, our Nabi Karim Salaam offered his masjid, the Masjid al Nawawi to the Christians who offer even the prayers. This is how tolerant and accommodative he was. But our Masjids are holier than his. No? Of course, they are more glamorous. Ours are more glamorous. In his day, it was mud walls, mud plastered on the ground, and thatch roof, palm leaf fiber. That was his Masjid. But I want to know. Whether our masjid is holier, more sacred than his masjid? Is it? But no, we won't allow the non-Muslim. And you don't know that the best place to talk to the non-Muslim is the masjid. What it happens to him, you don't know, you can't imagine. You take things for granted. Because you are born in it. From childhood you are going and coming out is well, it's all fun for you. For the non-Muslim, when he watches the Muslim going to the Jew, and watches all together, Allah, everybody around him is with you. And he says, there's nothing there. They're worshipping the unseen God of the universe. The impact that it has on the unbeliever, you can't imagine. What an opportunity. People are coming and we change them. Look through the window. You treat them like dogs. And you want to know one day they'll bite you, why they want to bite you. There's something gone wrong. Our understanding is so poor, so childish. I can't imagine that Muslims in the 20th century, 1400 years after, after the founding of Islam, or starting of Islam, that we can behave in this manner. That you want to keep people out of Allah's house. No doubt. He says, please take off your shoes. They don't mind. We don't want to force them to make wudu. We don't want to force them to do salat. Have a look. And then answer the question. What an opportunity. And after that, take them home for a cup of tea. Feed them with what you eat. Give them something to drink and you see what happens. You can change the people. They want to come. The Christians are calling them. The Chinese Buddhists are going to the ch churches. Because they are welcome. Welcome, Joe. Come, come. Chong, come, come. Lee, come, come. With your family. You know, you don't have to become a Christian. Come, come. And they woo the guy. And they love and compassion. And they're getting converted by the thousands. They're creating monsters for you. They are creating monsters for you. The Christian world, they lost this colonialism. They can't rule you anymore. They give you independence. But now this is a new type of colonization. They are creating monsters for you. There's only a question of time. Look, you lost already Singapore. Singapore was part of Malaysia. No! Answer me. Was it not a part of Malaysia? What happened to it? It's gone forever. 
to doomsday you can never get it back. Then you lost the right of this other province. Penang. I had to salute a Chinese gentleman. It was part of Malaysia. And there's some two places they won't allow me there. In Malaysia they won't allow me. Because the Christian is the head. Look, it's going. The cancer is on. And you're going to lose this if you become a cathedral or a, or a pagoda. I'm telling you, this is a love law. He says, وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِلْ أَوْمَنْ غَيْرَكُمْ If you do not carry out your duties and responsibilities, which Allah has imposed upon you for being the khaira ummat and the best of people, He says, يَسْتَبْدِلْ أَوْمَنْ غَيْرَكُمْ They substitute in your place another people. ثُمَّ لَا يَكُنُ وَمْسَالَكُمْ Then they won't be like you rubbish. I'm not talking, please, please, please. This is not Ahmad Didar, Allah is talking. Yes, the bill of Oman Khairatun. But you know, we are so well set. So were the Muslims in Spain, 800 years. They were well set. They had the whole country. They had all the riches. All the power was in the hand. Education, finance, politics, everything, livelihood, everything in the hands of the Muslims for 800 years. Hmm. How do you feel? You know, when that length of time when you are in a place, then you get into the groove, it gives you a very comfortable feeling. You know that? To get into the groove. You get that groovy feeling, they call it. Groovy feeling. And the difference between a groove and a grave, do you know what it is? What? A groove is 12 inches deep. At most. A grave is six foot deep. That's all. It's only a question of that. Your groove and your grave, the groove will take you into the grave. 800 years, they who Spain, the Muslims. They didn't do the job, same like us. They didn't do the job. Satisfied, we are Muslims. We pray five times a day, we make Hajj and Umrah, and inshallah we'll go to Jannah. I think that's cheap. Jannah is that cheap. It was so cheap for them. They were reading the Quran. They understood what Allah was talking. He was, he was warning them. He was telling them, come there to Jannah, to Uyun. How many were the gardens and the fountains they left behind? كَمْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ جَنَّاتِ وَعُيُونَ وَزُونُ وَمَكَانٍ كَرِيمٍ and confused and monumental building. What is this? That is your mustard, yes. Monumental building. Hmm? You know, you can boast about it. We have the most, I don't know, I must find some good words, you know, most fantastic, magnificent masjid in the world. We have it in Kuala Lumpur. Sultan Salahuddin Shah Masjid. It is no doubt. But Allah is telling you. Wazu wa makan kareem and pontius and monumental buildings. Wanaamatin kamu kiha fatihin and wealth and the amenities of life in which they took so much delight. This this is what I told you just now. Your air condition, air conditioning, air conditioned home, air conditioned masjids, your swimming pool in your houses. Nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. Wallah, nothing wrong. Your Mercedes Benzes and what? Huh? Your Rolls Royces. Nothing wrong. Allah blessed you, you. But He's lulling you. He's softening you up. And Allah is telling you. Wa ni'matin kanu fi hafatim. Kazalika wa awrasnaha qawman akhareen. Thus other people will make you inherit this. فَمَا بَكَتْ أَلَيْهِمُ السَّمَاءُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَا كَانُوا مُنْزَرِينَ Neither the heavens nor the earth shed a tear for them, nor was respite given to them anymore. You don't do the job. Allah says, فَتَرَبَّسُوا You wait. And they waited for 800 years. Allah waited and you waited. For what? فَيَعْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِ Until Allah's decision comes about. For your destruction, you fool. You wait for that. Allah says, wait and you waited. The Muslims have spent 800 years, they didn't do the job. And wiped out to an end. Not one guy left in the country to give their son. After 800 years, I don't know how many hundred years you were Islam here, I don't know. I don't have a ch chance of asking you people. How many hundred years are you Muslims here? My country, the Muslims of India, my people, two to four hundred years. We are new converts, relatives. I don't know about you. But now when you are here for a thousand years, the Ch in China, I understand, 1,300 years Islam is there. 1,300 years. The early Sahaba were there and they converted the people. There are 50 million Chinese Muslims. Do you know that? 50 million Chinese Muslims. But we, we look down upon the Chinese. You know that. We are racist. Do you know that? We are no better than...
white men in South Africa. We claim to be Muslims and we are broad-minded and you know, it's all hoax. We are racist. The Indian Muslim is a racist. The Malay Muslim is a racist. The least racist are the Malays of South Africa. The least racist. But they are also. We all have the sickness. You are reading the Quran, they were reading the Quran. But they were laughing at the Pharaoh. Pharaoh, Egyptians. The fools, they didn't learn a lesson. Look. كَمْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ جَنَّاتٍ وَعُيُونَ وَزُوءٍ وَمَكَانٍ كَرِيمٍ وَنِعْمَةٍ كَانُوا فِيهَا فَاكِهِينَ When they're reading that, they're thinking of the Egyptians, the fools. Allah sent plagues after plagues to them. One plague, two, three, five, ten plagues. And the fools didn't learn a lesson. Allah destroyed them in the Red Sea. Hiron and his army. Right? Right. <laughs> you see the bloody fools? But I'm telling you, you are in the firing line. You are in the firing line now. No, no. We look at the other fools. That's the nature of man. You, me, everybody. We look at the laugh at the other fools. Not mean that we are the fools now. We are the fools. They laughed. Their time came, destroyed. In Baghdad, Samar Khan, and Bukhara, and the Harun al Rashid, Mamun al Rashid, they created a veritable fairy land. That's, those things we can only now produce on films, except Sultan Salahuddin Masjid. We have. We have done something, alhamdulillah. But the warning, they didn't worry about the Mongols on the border. The Muslims in Spain, they didn't convert the Spanish people. You know why? They said these are pig eaters. <laughs> what can they understand about Islam? They are wine givers, they drink wine. What can they understand about Islam? I'm telling you, your forefathers could. You Arabs, you were barbarians of the highest order. You married your stepmothers, you people, you Arabs, of the Ayyamul Jahiliya. You, you buried your daughters alive, drunkards, adulterers, gamblers, fratricidal wars. Gibbon, the master historian, describes them in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire. He says, the human brute, these Arabs, animal in human form, almost without sense, is poorly distinguished from the rest of the animal creation. The only thing that differentiates him from the animal is the form. The Christian says, God created him in the image of God. We say, the Quran says, the ahsan taqween in the best of forms. Otherwise, an animal and worse than animal, these Arabs. They made the tawaf round the Kaaba, absolutely naked. Father, mother, daughter, granddaughter, daughter-in-law, everybody. Left, right, left, left, right, left. They did the tawaf. Absolutely naked, not even a G-string. You know the Western woman is G-string, the tanga, the bikini, not even that. You know that? These Arabs. I'm telling them, I say, your forefathers, they bring tawaf around the Kaaba absolutely naked. And they give some good reason, good logic, which was devilish, but good logic. I don't want to start wasting your time. But I'm just trying to show you. This Allah's deen, this Kalam can transform you barbarians, you animals, made you into people with light and learning for the world, posh bearers of light and learning. He did it in tens of years. This book can't change the Spanish people. No. It can't change the Mongols, no. It can't change the Hindus, no. It can't change the Chinese, no. What arrogance, what pride, I want to know, what pride and arrogance he has affected. How did you come about to be the superman? I want to know. That you will be exempt. Our Nabi said, Seek knowledge even into China. You heard that from your alim? If not, go and ask them. This Didai fellow is telling us, brought something new. He's saying that we must seek knowledge even into China. He said that our Nabi said that. This is a lie against the Prophet. Severe punishment. Hell, hell. You lie against the Prophet, the Prophet said, but he didn't say, he said, hell is for you. I don't want to go to hell. Go and ask your Ali. And before I go, write to me and say, look, our Sheikh of the Juma, with the great masjid here, he says, you don't know what you're talking about. He said, be that, and I'll have to retract. I want to come back again, but not with that charge on my head that I've been blessing you people. I'm telling you, our Nabi said, Utlubul ilmu wa lawkana Seek knowledge even into China. And I'm telling you, you don't have to go to China to seek knowledge. China has come to you. Can you learn something from them now? What's wrong with you? There's something we can learn from the Chinese. Allah, the humility. You people are nice, kind people. Sweet people. Allah, fantastic Muslims. But the Chinese can also teach us something. 
they can teach us. A taxi driver, a sick, sick taxi driver in KL was asked about your customers. He said, who are the best customers? The guy said, the Chinese. You know, humility. He's paying his pay, but you know, with a smile, he's got his way. Maybe he's acting, but can't you act good as a smile on your face? Come on, man. Can't you smile? I know you people have a great sense of humor. Since I started talking, how many times you laughed? I don't know if it's recorded. You keep count, and if you paid me for that, every laughter, I gave you, I said, look, hundred, hundred dollars each time you laugh. So come on, give it to me. I'll be a rich man. That humility is a Chinese. He pay and he very much. And the Malay is the most arrogant. He's a racist. Now, we were talking there about the white men in South Africa. Do you got the same sickness? Yes, but we don't see it. We can't see it. The white men didn't see that, that he was sick. We can be that sick. We are Malays. Not Muslims. We are Malays. As against the Chinese, as against the South Indians. This, Allah gave us this deen, this honor and this privilege of being the Khaira Ummah. It was an honor, was to be shared. It's not your father's property. It's not your grandfather's inheritance. The Jews made it so. And what happened to them? Six million Jews incinerated. Because they didn't do the job. In Germany, before Hitler, man for man, educationally, they were the supreme most people in Germany. In wealth and in education. They were the highest people. Every Jew was above the average German. In Germany. That didn't save them. They were racist. They kept religion for themselves. It was a racial preserve. They didn't share it with the Germans. If the Germans can worship a Jew as a god, I'm asking them why wouldn't they accept a Jew as a prophet, Moses? If you have told them so, if they can worship Jesus, the Jew as a god, the Germans, why wouldn't they accept another Jew as a prophet if you told them? No, you didn't tell them. You said, no, this is already this is a bloody fool. This is Gentile, Gentile, unclean, uncircumcised. Right. Allah says, yes, but Bill Kauman Hayrakim. To substitute in your place another people and with what what support? Six million Jews incinerated. We you think we are exempt from that law of change? Nobody is exempt. You don't do the job, so get out of the way, you rubbish. Yes, that's the power. My dear brothers and sisters, my plea to you is this. That look, this opportunity Allah has given you. Use it. And I am prepared to do something for you. I want to know from you from this audience here. How many of you know three languages? Only the other hands are three languages. The people who know English, they know Malaysian and Chinese, three languages. Three four languages. How many? Three, four languages. Those who know three languages. English, Malaysian and Chinese. Three languages. the Bible and the Quran about what I spoke, everything in a book called the Muslim Prayer. With your masjid in color, 
four color job. This must be not mine. Mine is there in 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 somewhere. I'll do your masjid with your picture, with this card there, same size, back of that principle of Islam, with your masjid. Every visitor has to come give it to him, give it to him. A moment of his visit. Then he takes it home and says, you know, I went to Shah Sultan Salahuddin Masjid. Yes. You know, it's one of the most fantastic structures in the world. Yes. Look at this. He shows his religion. Yes. Human nature. You can't just look at this and give it. You are the, you are the back. What is the back? Principles of Islam. You get into people's homes. I am prepared to do it for you. If you can't do it, I am prepared to pay for it and do it for you. I will go along. Big you from your Malay people. So come on, man. Give me five ringgit, fifty ringgit, five hundred ringgit. Do the job. And booklet you can give free about all these comparative verses I gave you. And the card of the your masjid on the top of the booklet will be your masjid. Man, a memento of their visit to the masjid. But Islam going into their home, where to America, to France, Germany, Japan, whoever comes along, give it to him, man. Give it to him. You can't do that. I can only try. I can only try. I know if you understood Urdu, I would have read some verses to you, and I could have shed tears, and I could have sat down. But I know it's useless talking to you, a language which you don't know at all. You see, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, and my dear brothers and sisters, I'm very grateful for the privilege that you brothers have given me, and I look forward to the opportunity of being of further service to you, further for the Islam. And I look forward to the opportunity of coming again and sharing with you. Oh, by the way, it was your question time. I forgot. So, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 But uh, please, for easier control, just na- state your name and where you're at. Maybe from Shalom, uh, section 4 Shalom, from there. You get the line up there from my chair. The line up there, you pick a pocket. The way they turn it. Go ahead. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sheikh Abadidat, my name is Suharjo Darmu Sadisari, and permit me to call you my father because when we met the first time in uh, Balmi, I think, you specifically addressed me when I stood up as, yes, my son. So today I would like to return the favor, if I may, to address you as my father. Now, in your booklet over here, and I do not deny the fact that even in the Quran, uh, there are words which are uh, that is the meaning of a good Christian, a good Jew, and so on and so forth. Could you please elaborate on the term a good Jew and a good Christian? Thank you. This is, I don't want to say that. There are good Jews and good Christians. I don't want to say that. But Allah says that. This is min humul mu'minuna. This is min humul mu'minuna. But if the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, if they hearken to this message, it will be better for them. In other words, it will be better for you, Muslims. Min humul mu'minuna, among them there are mu'min. Very high title. Allah says, Min humul mu'minuna, among them there are mu'min. Wa akhtaru humul fasikun. But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. And somewhere I mentioned that, look, if you have time, we can deal with that. I can show you the good Jews and the good Christians. There is a book written by Michael H. Hart. Michael H. Hart. The top hundred. It's called the hundred. The hundred, one hundred. Or the top hundred. The most influential men in, in history. From Adam alayhi salam up to today. So this man, Michael H. Hart, he gives you the list of the hundred and he de- evaluates the position, the quality. And he numbers our Nabi Karim. Number one, Muhammad. Number one, Muhammad. Number three, Jesus Christ. His God is number three. 
Now, what would you think of a man like that? He put his own God three and puts the other Mahdi number one. Then in the Times magazine, July 15, 1974, there were a series of essays under the heading, Who are history's great leaders? And they tell you, time after time, they tell you, Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. Jews, Masterman, a United States psychoanalyst, a professor at the Chicago University, in that article he says, before we confer greatness upon any individual, first we must find out what we are looking for in the man. And he gives three standards. Number one, we must find out that he, the person, whoever he is, he must be interested in the welfare of the lead, the people he's leading. He's not interested in milking cows for himself. Number two, he must provide a social organization in which people feel relatively secure. And number three, unity of belief. With these three standards, he searches history, and he analyzes Louis Pasteur, the man who discovered the anti-TB vaccine. Louis Pasteur, the, the, the microbe who, invent, who discovered the microbe. Salk, anti-TB vaccine, and so on. He analyzes Hitler, Mussolini as great, not good or bad. The guy was great. Ninety million Germans were prepared to march at his behest. Death or destiny. He was great. We're not talking about good or bad. The man can be evil, but he's great. Ninety million people are prepared to follow him. He analyzes Mahatma Gandhi, and so on and on, and Moses, and Jesus, and he comes to the conclusion that perhaps the greatest leader of all time was Muhammad, and to a lesser degree, he said Moses is the same. A Jew, he put Muhammad number one, and his own Moses number two. Now, these are the type of people, I say, they are milhamul mumina, they are good people. For us, the Ruhamul Pasir, but the majority of them are for the Two times. Good one and the evil. You must find ways and means of getting at them both. They are both your customers. You don't throw in the towel, is there, this guy is a rebellious fellow. No, 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 no. In the ayah, it's from Surah Nahr, chapter 16, ayah number 125, Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbi kabil hikmat. Invite all to the ways of the Lord with wisdom. Well, more as little hasanat and with beautiful teaching. Wajadil humbilatiya ahsan and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Abdullah Yusuf Ali, this translation. He gives a commentary on that word. It's worth checking out. You need it. Everybody needs it. This translation, you need it. But I give you his commentary. He says the feature of God's truth, you and I. We are supposed to, everybody is supposed to be doing the job. The preacher of God's truth may sometimes say to himself, what is the use of talking to these people? The Chinese, or the Jews, or anybody for that matter. You know, we have a tendency, ah, these are rubbish, man, leave them, you know, you're wasting your time. And the preacher of God's truth may sometimes say to himself, what is the use of talking to these people? They have already made up their mind. So let him not use this as a temptation. How could he know how the seed of the word of God may germinate in people's minds? You have no right to judge freehand. Go along. Did you do? Did you try? Just plant the seeds, the ideas, and inshallah they will grow. This is our duty. Get the translation. Learn the verses, Arabic and English, and go and start sharing. With you. Next one. Next question. Go to the mic, you two. Go to the mic, brother. So how yes. Go ahead, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, my name is Dr. Muhammad Musa. Today in the morning, I have you mentioned that the uh, comparative of religion is a uh, Western Muslim to go there the Muslim. How would you apply uh, Muslim profession who is not specialized in Islamic uh, studies to read and to do to be able to uh, you see, I have a shortcut for you people. I know the modern man, the intellectual, is too busy to read encyclopedia, to go to the library. Because I know the mentality of the modern man, so what I have done is, I print little booklets. Little, little booklets different, different subjects. Come on, man. One sitting reading. These are all Arabs in Israel, conflict of conciliation, Christ in Islam, 
Muhammad the natural successor to Christ, and on and on, Muhammad the greatest, one sitting reading. If that guy, whoever he is, if he reads something, and if it doesn't tickle him, all the books, nothing tickles him, he deserves to perish. <laughs> Look, the worth, it's a worthless rubbish. What you do with a human being, you know, you read and nothing interests you, nothing tickles you, nothing inspires you. That guy is an animal in human form. You know, he's just there, eat, drink, and make merry, for tomorrow we shall die. There's no difference between him and the animals. But any ordinary person, sincere-hearted person, once reading this booklet, anything that tickles you has a right. Learn the verses, memorize it, and go and start sharing it. Inshallah, your attitude to Islam will change and everything. Go, if he can, if he can't read, you tell him to see my videotapes. It seems to have changed a lot of people, you know, in the attitude. Inspired them to become better Muslims. At least put some militancy in you. You see, we are like castrated animals. The Muslim Ummah is like castrated animals, ready for slaughter. I said, no, this will put an injection into you. Look at the tapes, I make no commission on that. No copyright. You can get my tapes, reproduce them and sell them and make a profit. You can get my books, reproduce them and sell them and make a profit. No objection. Now, these are the ways I can suggest. The yeah. others, you go and ask your imams and your shafts, maybe they might have some better ideas. Is this suffice? Uh, no, no, nothing suffices. There's a world of knowledge is so vast. I can't suggest this book is going to do the job. It's just like he, if you're a doctor, you're a doctor, medical man. Yeah. You just don't say, look, take this aspirin and do the job. There are so many other complications there. So you have to treat the patient. The patient is very sick. The ummah is very sick. You know, from a medical point of view, spiritual, spiritually the sickness is, no, he's got diabetes, he's got blood pressure, he's got fire, the ummah. Then it was the amount of problems you have, you know, you need more than one did that, you know, to, to heal you. I'm talking to the You see, my, my, my approach is that I'm talking about me. You know, I don't know whether you notice the river. Jamal Badi, if you heard him, he is a great scholar. He is most learned among our people, Jamal Badr. That's on another level. We need his tapes, but they won't be as entertaining as mine. That's <laughs> Excuse me, can we... <laughs> Mr. Shavaya. Ah, one second. Oh, yeah, he was there before. Uh, Let him ask them you. Yes, yes my brother. Assalamu uh, alaikum, so, uh, brother Zidat. I am Mohammed Sadiq from Shalom. Uh, my question is a bit different from the others. It's just that I wanted, I was in USA a few months ago, and an American asked me, why you guys have, uh, you know, are so anti, I mean, you are anti, you know, Salman Rushdie and his book, so why don't you allow people to read his book and let them judge for themselves? Why do you have to suppress, you know? And uh, if by, by suppressing you are sort of, you are, you, know, you are feeling guilty, you feel that, you know, there's something wrong and this and that, let the people decide, let them read. So I, I, I was not able to really answer so I wonder whether you could uh, enlighten me on that. How one should, uh, you know, what, how should one, uh, what do you call, go ahead, I mean, you know, in trying to come up with such sort of uh, talk, you know? Yes. You see, one thing, number one, you ask the American, you want to give people the freedom of speech, right? It's right. What about communism? You allow communism, the books on Das, das Kapital by Karl Marx, you allow that in your country? You banned it, I want to know why. Aren't you American mature enough to weigh the pros and the cons, good or the bad? Damn it all, why do you have to stop your American people from reading Das Kapital? Eh? Anybody who's a commie, communist, you're going to put him in jail, right? Why aren't you giving him the freedom? With regards to Rushdie, tell, you see, what you have to learn is to turn the table. You know, turn the table. You don't start pleading for mercy. Don't start crying and wailing. You turn the table. I did it in the Royal Albert Hall. I turn the table. I'm telling the Britishers, start with Sulman Rushdie, Satanic Verses, page one. What does he call you? I read it out, I read it out to them. He's calling you Londoners are bastards, the whole lot of you. <laughs> I said, what Londoner are you? Pakistani Londoner? You British Londoner? You Jewish Londoner? You Hindu Londoner? You all are bastards. This is what Rushdie said. You accept that, you love that. You want that freedom of speech. So he calls Margaret Thatcher a bitch. You know what's a bitch? A whore. You like that? 
He, in the book he's writing, he had sex with the Queen, the Queen of England. He doesn't even spare her. Then I said, you white people, you know what he's calling you? Your mothers and your wives and your sisters and your daughters? He says, white women, no man, fat, Jewish or non-differential. White women are poor. I can't complete that sentence. <laughs> but there I did it, in London I did it. You see? So, you see, you have to learn to turn the table. What we do is we go into battle without knowing. That's the trouble with us. No, the trouble is I read the book. I just couldn't know what, what Gabba you was talking about. There's nothing. I just, from page one to the rest of the book, there was nothing I could understand. No. I couldn't apprehend anything. You know, 50, you see now, I don't, 52 times he's used the four-letter word. Do you know that? In combination with every other, 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 other alphabet. 52 times. You didn't read that? No. 52 yes. times, man. <laughs> no, you're right, but, you know, but the thing is, do you think it's wise to, I think it would be more in, uh, uh, proper, let people read it and, and let, let them make... Uh, uh, no, no, he said, look, if somebody swears your mother, calls your mother a bitch, a whore, I want to know how you react. Ask him. You see, the trouble is, you really, people didn't read the book. I'm watching a TV program from America. And one of these white interviews is interviewing a Muslim, a Pakistan. He said, all right, now tell us now, what was wrong with the book? What's wrong with it? He says, oh, he said very filthy, dirty things. He said, what did he say? And watch. You see, the camera is zooming on to the guy. Ooh, it's a killer. The camera is a killer. You know, you can show every, what, what, what's happening to your face and your... Uh, everything you can see, the, people can't see me now, but if the camera was on and if you're watching on the TV, you can say, hey, this guy, the question the guy asked this guy, his face crumbled up. <laughs> All that you can see. And you watch, I'm watching this brother of ours on on camera. And he is in trouble. He's, he's in a country. He doesn't know what to say. You know why? Because his mother he promised his mother, his wife, his daughter, he said, you know, I'll be on TV. Eight o'clock, watch, I'll be on TV. And he knows they're sitting there at home watching him. And now this interviewer is asking, what did he say? He said, very filthy, what did he say? So he said, very sure. That's right. Fifty million people are listening. What did they understand? What did you understand? Hmm? I can't translate it for you. I know what it means, but I can't translate it. The guy, the fool, should have said, you want me to say it? What he says? You know what it means? He said, yes, let's tell it. Let 50 million people hear. And then you read the reaction. He just used that, that sweet language of Bombay. He said, then sure. But nobody understood. Like I said it now, nobody, I hope nobody understood. <laughs> but now, ask that interviewer, you want me to tell you what it means? And if he said, yes, tell it. This is what he said, you people. You Americans, mother, mm, American. you Britishers, your sister, Britishers. Tell him, man, tell him. I can't tell you here, but I told him there in Royal Albert Hall. Who? Because I said, you people, you say it's very good. I said, I listen now. The shit, you say, it's good. La I'll, I'll plaster you with it. I plaster them. You have to know the devil. Well, how do you treat the devil? You treat him with the fire. You see, you can't fight the devil with holy water. Zum zum water. You can't fight the devil, shaitan, with zum zum water. You need fire. My father said you can, but can't fight the shaitan with zum zum water. That's what the Malays are trying to do. The Pakistanis and the Hindis and the Arabs on the place, you want to burn the shaitan with zamzam water. That's <laughs> what they won't do. You need fire. And Ahmad Dizah doesn't got that fire. Yes, my sister, you. Please. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Brother Shia Madhidat. Uh, one comment on your talk earlier, or maybe one correction. They did allow uh, one Christian to enter the beautiful mosque here in 1989 and she was Queen Elizabeth when she came for the Commonwealth Gates of Government meeting. She came? Yes. Into the masjid? Yes. It was Alhamdulillah. On, it, Alhamdulillah. Was, it was on television. 
Huh? It was on television. Yes. She came into the masjid. Yes. yes. They allowed her. Yes. Then why shouldn't they allow a Chinese woman to come there? I want to know. <laughs> we can't have double standards. We are hypocrites. You are hypocrites of the highest order. See, that's the Queen Elizabeth. She doesn't wash her, wash her backside. That I know. She uses the toilet paper. Tell me, God. No, no. I want to know what kind of hypocrisy is this? These are your hypocrites of the highest order. If Queen Elizabeth can come, I want to know why a poor fully rickshaw puller can't come. I want to know. You hypocrites, you have double standards. You deserve to perish. I'm glad, happy, my sister. I thank you very much. I want to meet those alims now who say this Chinese woman can't come there and this Chinese man can't come there. I want to meet the guys. Bring them to me. Yes, I want to know how they allowed Queen Elizabeth to get inside. Yes, and she was given this heavily brocade, you know, to no, that's it. No, that's Just because a woman, that's all, a woman in the masjid. Just because See? she was a member of the Winter family. To hell with that. Yes. To me, the principle, is the principle involved. You allow one woman, I want to know why they won't allow another woman. I'm very glad to uh, see such a reaction from you. No, uh, that's me. That's I, me. I had really managed to be sarcastic just now. Mm -hmm. Sister, yeah, that's Alhamdulillah, me. No, no, that sister, we have such an uh, answer from you. If they don't allow me to come into your country again, it doesn't matter. There it are, doesn't matter, by God. I don't care. Many, there are many more countries now. Yes. No, the, the world is so vast. With the breakup of the Soviet Union, there are more republics. Inshallah. I'll realize with that, Inshallah. No. Okay. No, good sense will prove, yes. Inshallah. Just, yeah. uh, just one more question. All right, sister. I remember. Although usually I only allow one question at a time. <laughs> but however. Please. Yeah, I remember the one uh, television clipping of your sermon in South Africa, yes. and you were saying that the Muslim pray, uh, the, mo the way we pray as Muslims, is different from the Christian prayer. Right. While the Christian supplicate, right. our, that ours is a form of brainwashing right. of uh, indoctrination. Right, 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 right. Could you elaborate here, please, just for All the right. benefit of All the right. audience? All and right. thirdly, yes. I want to ask because you. You offer us just now that we could go to South Africa for yes. one month yes. training. Yes. Are the Muslim ladies allowed? People like me, I'm considered my, my, controversial. My sister, Can I be allowed? No. If you are with your husband. Oh, I see. No, no, I tell you why. Look, <laughs> Islam, this is the teaching of Islam. Yes. You, my sister, my daughter, you know, suppose you have the need to go for Hajj. Yes. Islam says you can't go alone. Yes. You need somebody, your husband with you, your brother, anybody with whom you can marry yeah. your father. Yeah. You know, that is about going for Hajj. Yeah. Now, this well, I not, don't have a brother and I don't no, have a father. No, no, no. Yeah. That's a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So if you can't go for Hajj, you know, this was less important than Hajj yeah. if you had the need. So now you come there and a sister, that, that means I will have to look after you. Yeah. I have to take you home and chaperone you around, or somebody else, it's very, very hard. But these young men, I can put them into a hotel, at the right, three meals a day, you come along at 8 o'clock to the office, and we'll do the job, whole day, go back and learn your lesson, come back. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you that. Mm -hmm. You see, I have to look after you, and it's a bit too much at the present moment. Mm -hmm. Inshallah, one day. Okay, anyway, just now I didn't, I didn't introduce myself. I listened to your lecture on at uh, Abim, Yes. The Islamic Outreach on Sunday. Yes. yes, and I presented you my first book of poetry. Uh, and later on, I hope I can give you something because you said about the six million Jews being killed. I have enough evidence to, to say that not six million Jews were killed, etc., right. uh, etc. Et yes, right. Some other time, I'll yes. uh, continue. Uh, the only thing I say is, look, it's, it's not, it's not the six million. It's the principle. See what yeah. the, 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 Six hundred Jews were killed. Yeah. Because of race, it is it is bad enough. It is grave enough. Mm. Even six hundred, six thousand. You don't. It's a figure I'm giving. Is what they say. It's a right. Six million Jews died. So I'm asking the Jews, mm. why? You didn't do the job. If you did the job, there'll be ninety million Jews. You would have had a rough time. I'm telling yeah. you. If the Jews had done the job in Germany. All the Germans would have been Jews. We'd have had a rough time with them. Right? So I said, look, if you say six million, six million. But, can you see, because you didn't do your job, you made your religion a racist religion, mm -hmm. this is what happened. In, in, by extension, I'm telling the Muslims, same thing can happen to us. Mm -hmm. That's all. Learn a lesson. Mm -hmm. Whether six million or six hundred, it is bad enough. Mm -hmm. That is all. Yeah. Thank you.
Let's give some real time. Assalamu alaikum. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, my brother. Yes, uh, brother, did that peace be upon you? Thank you. Um, now, no more addition to the excuse, please. Right? We are two there and two there finished. Okay? The last to you is the gentleman behind you. You can ask a question? Right. Okay, that's two there and two there. Right. Right, Mr. Chairman? Two and two. Right. <laughs> uh, Brother Didat, um, many people in this country um, do not like dogs. Um, I understand. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I understand that either in the Hadith or in the Quran, um, dogs are one of the first animals uh, to be admitted into heaven. And they dogs? Have, dogs? Dogs? Yes. Animals to be admitted dogs. into heaven? Yes, I understand. So something, new, something new. Something <laughs> new. <laughs> um, which, which, which book says that? They don't have to be in human uniform even. Huh? They don't have to be in human uniform. Oh. <laughs> anyway, many right. people don't like dogs in this country. And, uh, but as you said earlier, we, but the Chinese in this country like dogs. They eat them up in China, they finish them up. You know that? <laughs> yes, they um, finish them up. But I've, I've read somewhere in the Quran, there are some, uh, or in the Hadith, some reference, references anyway, yes. which are positive. For example, about the fact that a dog, or a number of dogs, hide, help to hide the companions of the... Uh? Cave, cave. The cave, yeah, the cave, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, somewhere they mentioned but the, the privileged position of the dog as far as... Uh, and also the other, what they call, short stories about how a prostitute has to find water for a dog and the prostitute is forgiven and so on. So, mention of a dog in the Quran is all positive, but many people have this antipathy... No, 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 no. is it positive you're talking about? A reference is made in the Quran that look at your food, and the dog and so and so. The, the, the Christians, the Christians of Ephesus, references to them is not in the house of Islam that the that Prophet Sallallahu or any of the Sahaba kept dogs. There's no mention. Abu Huraira means the father of the cat. In a Sahaba of a very high order, he used to love cat. And his name we mentioned again Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira means the father of the cat. Father of the cat. There's no Abu Kalb. Among the Sahabas, the father of the dog, there's nothing like that. Then, you see, this animal is the most faithful animal. There are certain good qualities about it. One of our South African poets, he wrote some beautiful words about the dog. He said, fidelity, faithfulness, is said to be a human attribute, which makes the modern gentleman distinguish from the brute. But that supreme fidelity, inborn in every hound, every dog, which is the mark of man's best friend, in man is rarely found. The dog, in many cases, is more faithful to you than other human beings. Right? But there is a place for the dog. Where? As a guard dog? Yes. As a hunting dog? Yes, it's not allowed. Not as a pet in your house, in your bedroom, in your bed. This is what the white man is doing. I read again and again a case where the man is suing for divorce from his wife. You know why? Because when you get in the bed, the dog growls. When the chair, eh, this is mine. That's why his wife is his, the dog's wife. <laughs> so, he said, look, I want to divorce. So, Islam doesn't allow that. You can't keep them as pets, you can't fondle them, you can't handle them. As guard dogs, they're very faithful. Keep them outside, in the place. Feed them, look after them, protect them. As a hunting dog, Islam allows, but not as pets. Right? Because our learned men say that the saliva of the dog will, will make you, will contaminate you. There are so many factors. And the best thing is, less said the better. Our men said that and relatively we are safer than the other nations who keep dogs. See, there are more than 60 million dogs in Britain. 60 million dogs! You know that? In America, you go to Bronx, Bronx in New York. And you have to mind your steps. Every other step you can dog shit, dog shit, dog shit. I've seen on film, in America, the guy is taking his dog for a walk, and the dog excretes. So he takes a plastic bag, and he takes the shit, and he goes and carries it, and he goes and... This is what you have come to. You have to now carry your dog shit. <laughs> so I said, there's something wrong with you. The whole nation is gone to the dog. Brother Lee, brother, I know the prophet 
uh, picked up for what? What? What I do? I do something new. I, I understand he keeps it as a companion. No, 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 no. I don't know where you get all this from about dogs and dogs and dogs. Where you come such thing from, I don't know. <laughs> Look, in my life, I haven't come across that statement. Anyway. Right? I don't know whether why, what makes you fond of dogs. <laughs> you must read Dr. Kinsey's The Life of the American Female, and he'll tell you why you shouldn't keep dogs. And you read Masters and Johnson, he'll tell you why you shouldn't keep dogs. Go, read them. Dr. Kinsey, The Life of the American Female, and read Masters and Johnson on, on the American sex life. And he'll tell you why you shouldn't keep dogs. Right, next one, yeah. <laughs> this idea, come, 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 back. Good evening. Um, do forgive me for not knowing the holy verses huh, before starting this morning. And uh, I remember that uh, Sri Amal Yudas mentioned a word about um, comparative religion from a second earlier. I wish to ask few questions, uh, just two. On no, the, not only one. Only one. Only one. Okay, I'll ask the most important question. Yes. Um, and I'd like to give one criticism also, please. No, 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 no. You leave that for yourself. Then. <laughs> ask the question. Or ask, go with the criticism. Whatever you want. Choice is yours. So you want to criticize, criticize, or you want to ask question, ask question. Okay, not two things, not two things. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, the question is from Nikon Philly, but I feel it is it is significant. The question is, who is man and what is the goal of life? And I uh, humbly request uh, Sri Ramad Didat, the Lord Didat, to uh, enlighten on this question in the light of comparative religion study. Thank you. Uh, have you got use of Ali's translation? Sorry? Have you got use of Ali's translation, this translation? Which translation? Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Sorry, I'm a non-Muslim. That's all right. That doesn't mean that you can't have this. No, I don't have that. You, I'm sure they're selling them outside. If you open the index, mm -hmm. open the index, and the M, look for man. You want to know about man? Yes. You want to know about man? Right. Look at the man. I'll tell you what it says about man. Man, over 50 different references. How many? 50. If I started giving you one minute for each, you were another hour, huh? <laughs> man, God's purpose with man. Second item, why is on earth? He's tested by God. Things men covet his duty. He's created from clay for a term. He's called to account. Will return to God. It's confusing. Fifty-five different references. Excuse me, I'd like to limit my question to a small scope. That is, uh, I'd like to know that whether the man is the body, the mind, or uh, what do you call uh, metaphysical entity or soul. Yes, sir. His body, mind, and soul. All together? Man. Complete man. Body, mind, and soul. Okay? Thank you. This side, last, this side, and one more day. Yes? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. I want to ask one question about... Uh, anyway, my name is Mama Azharani. Uh, I came from uh, ITM Shalam. My question is, I have heard that uh, in UK there is a Bible which is being translated to Arabic language, which when we read it, that we can distinguish between Al-Quran and Injil. Okay. Uh, I said if, uh, if we know the Arabic language. Uh. So I want to ask you about this question. How can I answer if one Christian asks me that they just, what's wrong? Uh, that what they have done is against what Allah said in Al-Quran. What? Said is what? I mean, uh, say we know that Allah said in Al-Quran that uh, if you want to say that Al-Quran is liar or something, uh, it's not true, then you can uh, try to, what's it called? Try to make another Quran 
uh, even though it is just a surah, okay, then the, Christ, the Christian they can translate the whole Bible to Arabic language just maybe for against what for Allah say in Quran. You understand the question? <laughs> okay, maybe I'll say a specific question. Okay, huh? this is a little bit a long question. Okay, uh, what I have heard that in UK there is a Bible. There Black is, bird. There was a Bible. A Bible. A Bible. There is a Bible that been translated to Arabic language. Yes, so the, yes, the Arabic Bible is available. Yes, so what? Okay. Uh, which is uh, when we read it, and right. then when uh, we don't know any Arabic language and we don't know any Arabic, so when we read it, that we can distinguish between Arabic and between Quran and Injil, between Quran and Bible. That means that oh yes, this chalk and cheese. The difference between the Quranic Arabic and the Arabic of the Bible is chalk and cheese. You know, pulls apart, pulls apart. Oh. There is no comparison whatsoever. No, okay. Arabic, but there is no comparison. No comparison. Arabic is Arabic. You can write Lady Chatterjee's lover in Arabic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, but it is not comparing to the Quran. So the Arabic Bible is the Arabic Bible, but there is no comparison with the Quran. See, you want me to quote you some verses from the Bible and the Quran? Mm -hmm. huh? أُكِيمُوا لَهُمْ نَبِيًّا مِنْ وَسَطِ إِخْوَتِهِمْ نِسْبَةَ وَأَجَلُ كَلَامِي فِي فَمِهِ فَيَكَلَّمُهُمْ بِكُلِّ مَا أُوتِيَ بِهِ وَيَقُولُ أَنَّ الْإِنْسَانَ الَّذِي لَا يَسْمُو لِكَلَامِي يَتَكَلَّمُ بِهِ بِإِسْمِ أَنَا أُطَالِبُهُ You see, what I did was, when I learned this first, I went and tested an alim. I went to him. I said, Mawli Sahib, you know, respected Mawlana, Mawli Sahib, the Shaykh Imam. I said, look, I want you to tell me where this verse is in the Quran. So saying I read it. Ukimu lahum nabiyam min wasati ikhwatihim mislata. Vajadu kalami fi famiti. Vajakallamuhum bi kulli ma usihi. Bihi. He said no, it's not in the Quran. Vajadu kalami fi famiti. Vajakallamuhum bi kulli ma usihi. Bihi. He said no, it's not in the Quran. So I asked him, is it in the Hadith? He says, no, that doesn't sound like Hadith. Then I said, where could it be from? So he said, This might be some great man, somebody has written some books, and this is a quotation from there. You see, the person has got some knowledge, some little knowledge about the Quran. He knows the Quran, you know, the sublimity of the message, the verse, compared to any other book in any other language. In Arabic, there is nothing to compare it. And this is a Christian of that knowledge. The Quran is the supermost piece of literature in Arabic. In Arabic. Nothing comes to it. So, this is the Christian Arabic they acknowledge. The enemy, they know that the enemy doesn't know. There is nothing to compare it. The Christians have tried, so they have tried to produce something like the Quran. And I'm not giving you. An example of what they did to the Arab, I'm sorry, to the Malaysian and the Indian and the African, Nigerians and all, we won't know the difference. We might not know. But while I'm reading it to the Arab, or I ask the Arab to read it, man, he bursts out into laughter like a madman. Listen. This is the new Injil the Christians have created. It is a 16-year project, Arab Christians, they did it. To meet the Quranic challenge. Allah says, قُلْ لَئِنِ جَتَمَعَتِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُّ أَلَا عَنْ يَعْتُ بِمِسْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ Say, if the whole of mankind and the spirit world were to gather together to produce the like of this Quran, Allah says, لَا يَعْتُونَ بِمِسْلِهِ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ فَهِرًا They'll never be able to produce the like thereof, even if they backed up each other with help and support. That's a challenge for 1400 years. But the Christians are claiming now that they have done the job. They are meeting the Quranic challenge. I don't know whether you have this in mind, I don't know. But this is, I'm going to read it to you now, what the Christians have done. Listen. Babu Sakina. This is the New Testament I'm reading in Arabic. 
New New Testament, New New Testament. Must be seen. Must be seen. The heading, must be seen. Mr. Chairman, come and send me in. <laughs> must be seen. You see, we have the Quran, surahs in the Quran, it's a Makkiya Madaniya. So now it's a Makdisi, some, something similar, Makkiya, Madaniya, Makdisi, Galilee. Because you see, it's creating familiarity, they call it contextualization, making you to accept when you want to catch fish, you give the fish what it likes. Not you like the worm, you don't like it. Like one American said, I like strawberry and cream, but when I go fishing, I put a worm. You like worms? No. Why do you put a worm? Because you know the fish will like it. So when they catch fish. So this is now to catch this fish, Muslim fish. <laughs> what happened? What happened? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I'm reading the Christian Bible now. Any objection? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Am I right? Any objection? You can't. Is Allah Salaam. They stole it from the Quran. This is called plagiarism. <laughs> plagiarism in stealing in literature. Without acknowledging that is thief, thiefery. You, know, you, you are a cheat, you are a robber, you are a thief. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Qul, Ya Yuhallazina Amanu. Any objection? No, these are verses and phrases borrowed from the Quran. They don't exist in the Bible. But somehow to catch this fish. And this is being recited from Monte Carlo Radio. And people are listening, like Basit, Abdul Samad Abdul Basit. They, they, know, they know how to imitate. They imitate Basit. And you listen. This is a Quranic recital. And you listen, maybe from Malaysia or where. You listen. And while you listen, you get a little shock. It's something that is not familiar. Then you listen again. It's like the Quran. And again, a little shock. You know, because it's not, it doesn't sound like the Quran. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِن كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ حَقًّا فَآمِنُوا بِهِ وَلَا تَخَافُوا إِنَّ لَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهِ جَنَّاتٍ نُزُلًا These are words and phrases taken from the Quran but somehow hook by proof so they have done it but if you read this with the Arab he bursts out into laughter like my, mad. They can see the funniness of the whole thing, but we, non arabs we can get caught with it. This is a new strategy of deceiving the Muslims into thinking that this is something like a Quran. I hope that is what you had in mind. Thank you. Very handsome question. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Brother Bidat. I'm very amazed that the way he can spend what two and a half hours spending and memorizing all the verses, Quran, and Bible, and even books. Luckily, he stopped because I'm afraid he can pull out more rabbits or books from his bag and fill up the table. Uh, just some clarification on the part of the masjid. We have two guides for the masjid. We have guides. We have two guides. And uh, with due respect to Brother Omar, we are. In fact, we are engaging in services of a white to guide two guys, two, two, guys, two guys in the masjid. A white man from from US, from United States. But the Omar is out there. So, <clears throat> the other one is that uh, we are in the process of uh, making a tape, a video on the, on the masjid, so that when the visitors come, they will see the tape before they go on a tour of the masjid. Yes. And uh, the third one is that uh, even the template. We are talking about that. But anyway, we thank you very much for your to offer on the template and also the training. Oh, we have one of the brothers, man, he's a member of the Majlis of Masjid, and he has clarified that the Queen was not permitted into the prayer hall. He was, she was taken around, but not inside the prayer hall. So I think I, I think we will, we will we will defer that discussion to a later or another occasion, and uh, because we have two different views on 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 that issue, so I think on behalf of the masjid and on behalf of the Shahala Municipal Council and the um, uh, 
and the Umar Sultan Nabi Hajj would like to thank mm-hmm. Brother Bidat for for his uh, this lecture. Excuse me, Abhir, Abhir. Excuse me, Abhir, Abhir. Uh, me and my friend here, we, we waited for a long time for Mr. Didat to answer our question, so we would like, I would like Mr. Didat to answer one question from Uncle here. Oh, sorry, because he was up there. Do you want to explain one more question? He was up there. He was up there. He should have come down. You only saw it the last question and last question. He should have come down and you have answered it. I'm very sorry about that. So, I think uh, on behalf of uh, the organizers, we'd like to thank Dr. Didat very much for his beautiful lecture. I would thank every one of you for coming to this uh, function. So to close our function, inshallah, we will read a surah from the Quran, Surah al As. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.